I completely forgot there's a remake of Children of the Corn coming out. That is really going to tarnish the legacy of the original 1984 film, its eight sequels, and the other remake from 2009. Obviously a warning to always take the interstate and not the country roads. You may in fact end up in a town run by children who kill anyone over the age of 18. Hey, wait a minute. I remember something like this from South Park. The film was based on the short story by Stephen King, which first appeared in a 1977 penthouse and then in 1978's Night Shift. Two scripts were written for the adaptation, one of which by King himself, but the producers preferred the script from George Goldsmith, leading to more back and forths and disagreements between Goldsmith and King, as well as with the producers. On the plus side though, George did write the 1981 film Force 5. That movie is a lot of things, but boring isn't one of them. It was also the first film for director Fritz Kirsch. Again, he can direct some entertainment. He did 1985's Tough Turf. King would later ask for more of a salary or else he wouldn't let them continue with the movie, resulting in the budget for the film being severely cut, making it to where there were a lot of scenes that couldn't be filmed or some death scenes had to be altered. There is a rumor this was done out of some pure old school revenge. And it's from New World Pictures. If it ain't canon, make it New World. Naturally, it starts with the creepy kid music. That means it's either a Children of the Corn movie or an Amityville movie. Psych! Hills Have Eyes movie! Ah, uh, I see images like this and I think home. Sure, it takes place in Nebraska, but it could be central Illinois. The memorable score is by Jonathan Elias, which sounds like a character that could be in Children of the Corn. And the dude's a legend. He co-created the moon landing score from MTV. But meanwhile, after the Hapshat's wedding, the movie is told from the point of view of one of the kids, Joby. It was about three years ago. I was the only kid in church that day. Earl, come get your kid. I'm trying to eat here. Seems like a normal day in small town Kingsville. That's when I saw Malachi and the others. And it was then I knew I was in a King story. They have distinct bully looks about them. Anyway, mmm, 80s child diets. As for his sister, Sarah. I'm worried, Dave. Her fever's gone from 101 to 104. Have you tried giving her strawberry milkshakes? This town gets real weird real quick. Sure. Excellent, the shipment of Quaker Oats has arrived! Sick and tired of no updates on the mazes on the kids' menu, they must do what needs to be done. Poison the adults in town! It could be worse. In the town where Estes Perkle preaches, commies would have shot them to death. Oh, and she has a psychic connection. Another tragedy that Mother Abigail did not stop. And if the poison doesn't work, plan B is death by meat slicer? It is a damn good opening and goes along with some other notable killer kid movies of the time, like The Children and Bloody Birthday. But the biggest twist, there are no parents around to hang her psychic drawings on the fridge. Sure, it sounds creepy with the music, but change the score and it could be a nice jaunty musical. It wouldn't surprise me if the budget was so cut that these are the movie's storyboards. It's now present day, 1984, quite a notable year for any character played by Linda Hamilton. She and Peter Horton of 30-something play young couple Bert and Vicky, who are gonna find out the hard way to never have kids. And it's his birthday, too. Oh my god, honey, you invented flash drives! We're gonna be rich! And we need some old school rock to fill in this King verse. Now I can stay out late with my buddies. I can do. Told you it was a musical. And when we come back, Mr. Del Shannon. The best Nebraska high school football players of 1981 are now getting ready to play in that classic 24th annual Nebraska Shrine Bowl in Lincoln's Memorial Stadium, Saturday afternoon, August 7. Call me sentimental, but I like Midwest looking movies like this. The cinematographer gets the feel of driving through these states down. Snob fans will know this man's work. He also shot Friday the 13th, The Final Chapter, and Top Dog. 
Although usually I'm used to seeing the Amish at Union Station, not doing hilarious pranks. Actually, they're just gonna talk about classic horror characters. Joby was in Monster Squad. They're very disappointed in all the strict rules from their cult leader, Isaac. They got a foolproof plan, though. Keep a lookout while he goes into the corn to find some baseball players to help them out. But back to driving through Nebraska. Seems about right. You can pass the time by listening to religious radio. But there's no room for the fornicator. They do get the Perkle channel. No room for people who watch public television. No room for commitment. Amen. Subtle, honey. Real subtle. We're just trying to have a good time here. Come on. The kid's plan didn't go too well. This is a king story, son. We ain't afraid to kill some kids here. I'm just kidding. The monster in the field didn't kill the kid. He's fine. Fred, look out! <laughs> er, <laughs> at least he was fine. The movie picks up where the village leaves off. Look, he's with God now, honey. The preacher on the radio said so. Aw, oh, damn it. We need that meat for the diner. We didn't think too many things through when we took over this town. I haven't seen this movie since high school, but there are things that have stuck with me over the years, particularly the villains like Courtney Gaines as Malachi, who through the power of Christ can, I don't know, sort of appear or disappear without our leads seeing him lurking around. There's a reason for that, folks. <laughs> Fake out dream sequence. So did she also dream that Malachi was there? Look, everyone's psychic, okay? We're gonna give him a proper burial. This is more dignified than when we put Aunt Edna on top of the car. There is something that continues to not work here. Me and Sarah are playing in our old house. We played there lots. The narration. He's talking like it's a family movie about a dog. And it just goes away like halfway into the movie. Good news is, I guess Sarah's fine. They can simply reenact Full House to keep them entertained. Actress Anne-Marie McAvoy was on that show. The kids seem to be making the best of things. Took them years, but they finally learned to play Monopoly. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit, Boardwalk came to collect. It is a little unfocused how it keeps cutting back and forth between what's going on in Gatlin and the stuff with Bert and Vicky. It causes a bit of whiplash whenever it cuts. There really could have been a bit more mystery with the film if we're figuring out things simultaneous to the couple instead of already being shown a lot of the answers. Which in King's script, it was primarily focused on the couple in the first act. It's hard to get mad though, considering how great Courtney Gaines is and definitely John Franklin as Isaac. Dudes like Damien if he was raised by Carrie White's mom. Again, I don't know if their trip to Gatlin really needed to be shown in real time. We do get to see what's inside the kid's suitcase, though. Jesus Christ. Not in my book. You're clearly unaware of the Corn James version. Uh, there's gotta be a Casey's around here somewhere. Oh, thank God, R.G. Armstrong. Assemble your best men, General Phillips. Not quite what I was expecting from Predator vs. the Terminator, but there is a storm coming. They're in luck. They've been looking for hours for a don't go down that road character. He tells them not to go to Gatlin, but whatever, they'll still go to Gatlin, even with or without the sign tricking them. It also keeps cutting back and forth during Deal's death scene. My god, a re-edit would do this movie wonders. It's edited like a rough cut. Well, that's what he gets for working at the gas station from Halloween 4, where Michael got his coveralls and truck. Plus, they can experience the corn maze. The corn probably wouldn't be any good anyway. A lot of it had to be painted green since the movie was shot when the corn was dying. He is furious they went around in a circle. Don't ever show up in my emergency room, buddy. So he's gonna commit medical malpractice? The movie does need to kick it up a notch. And the Lord did show all this to me. Praise God! And a sermon by Isaac will do the trick, where he preaches about their God, He Who Walks Behind the Rose, a deity dedicated to a movie theater usher. 
It's good they put him in charge. John Franklin is 24 years old here. Isaac has his own kiss-ass assistant, too. Cast him instead upon the road. And so it was done. Joseph the Betrayer was cast out. It's like Grover Dill and Scott Farkas, only if Grover was in charge. And oh no, they sacrificed Kent McCord of Adam-12 for their sins! It's almost halfway through and they finally arrived at Gatlin. They know something is wrong when the liquor store isn't even open. But the diner does have three-year-old biscuits and gravy, still good and sitting on the table, plus newsies lurking outside. Hey, hey, wait, wait a minute! Come back here! Come on, Vicky. Hurry up, I don't want to lose them. Why? Why chase them down? Just leave! Look, we're already in the car. Why don't we just go on to Hemingford? It'll this movie would be so much shorter if he listened to her this whole time. Never mind, screw that! Let's chase them around for looking inside of our car! Let's check it out. Why? I thought we were going. Thank you. Oh my god, thank you. This guy keeps making dumb decisions, but it is made better by the fact that there is a character there constantly telling him these are bad decisions. This right here sums up their entire relationship. They picked the right house. It's the one with the Rockin' Del Shannon soundtrack. <sighs> Sweet, scooch over. She's watching Crime Story. I don't know if Sarah's gonna be any help. Are your mommy and daddy around? They're in the cornfield. Oh, what a surprise. She's vague. Let's get the hell out of here. He does confirm that this is a normal house. Every house around here has this view. Still, he wants to go to the town square, as if he's confusing this obvious sinister ghost town with Stars Hollow. Yeah, it's a little weird here, but it's safe. Your boyfriend's an idiot. But sure, let's split up. She can talk more about Sarah's psychic drawings, while Bert is probably under the impression there's a pep rally going on. Wait, what? It's also abandoned? Damn those paratrooping Russians and Cubans! This movie is like the makers of Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey made a movie about the Buttercream Gang. It almost even has a Roger Corman feel about it in scenes where he's walking through the deserted town. Makes sense it's from New World Pictures. How many more abandoned buildings does he need to see to be like, okay, yeah, let's get out of here. Even the poster of Blue Anthropophagus isn't tipping him off. She's putting things together way quicker, obviously. What do you want? We want to give you peace. He's lying. They relax her by saying, don't worry, the movie version isn't going to have the same ending as the short story. Bert finally catches up, though. That's yeah, weird here, but it's safe. Are we safe? Yeah. Yeah. Really? That was the last straw? That and flashbacks? Sadly, they're stuck, for the car is more corn now than machine. Great, he has to be the hero now. Vicky is screwed. Unless it goes for a midsummer ending, Bert will pay for his bad decisions. Every scene with Isaac and Malachi, though, still works. And did you not spill the blood of the old man when his oil and gasoline were still useful? We have our own fuel now from the corn. They're rehearsing their own cable news debate show. Even then, it's still pretty jumbled. There's so many times it's like whole scenes are split in half to insert another unrelated scene. Maybe he'll be a little more on his guard now. Sure, walk through that. On the plus side, this cross is very cushiony. Really, it's kind of comfortable hanging out up here. Also, Bert's sneaking around skills are getting worse. And now the blood of Amos will be shared. Stop it! Stop that! Don't interrupt Amos's passage. That's John Philbin. It's his initiation into the gang of presidents from Point Break. Like in other King stories, there's commentary here on rewriting scripture to fill the needs of the villains. And when they get sacrificed after reaching adulthood, it's clear the last movie that came to the town theater was Logan's Run. He's not even being chased by the kids for a good reason. Normally in this town, this is how they sell Girl Scout cookies. But the winner of the town scream? <coughs> it does hurt to run with Jock Itch. You kids are in big trouble! Take me to wherever your parents are immediately! And no movie quotes. <laughs> Outlander! 
that's where that's from. And when we come back, more Outlander! What do we do, Mordecai? We wait. Whatever you do, just stay in this abandoned IGA and don't make a sound. Shit. Well, hope he didn't hear that. Even when he gets a one-up on Malachi, this happens. <laughs> Useless! Hell, I think Joby is just hiding Bert out to save the man from himself. Anyway, take your time playing games with the kids. Vicky ain't going anywhere. There's trouble in paradise, though, when they argue about just how much of a violent, jealous god they have. Plus, Malachi wants to go for the happier ending by cutting Vicky down instead of killing her like in the story. Here, put Isaac in her place. I'm sure Bert will show up any time to rescue her. Are you looking for that lady? Yeah, you know where she is? They took her out to the clearing. You were just now telling him that? Plus, putting Isaac on the cross just makes his acting even more awesome. None of you will be forgiven! All of you shall feel his wrath! Pay no attention to Eddie Munster. When he gets to heaven, he'll get his Oscar. By the way, side note, just how Midwest is this movie? I'm not even joking. At this point in watching it, there was a tornado alarm outside. I'm serious. Again, asshole, what are you doing? Don't you hear the tornado sirens? I'm sure whatever he's gonna do is just gonna make the corn fire even worse. Luckily for him, though, that plan will work. On the one hand, though, there does appear to be a supernatural force in the corn, so murderous as the children are, I guess they're right, whatever it is has possessed the gophers. It's clear that I have to make a reference that it was indeed the Predator this whole time, no matter how much it is begging me to make a take on me by AHA reference. Oh, and then this happens. He'll be back in one of the sequels. Now Bert gives them a stern lecture on how they did not honor their father or mother. Malachi is having none of his plan to save the children by lining them up and paddling their behinds with his belt. He will show them the back of his hand, though. Hey, Pinocchio, where are you going? And Isaac isn't quite done yet, thank God. I landed in the Pillsbury factory, you asshole. What is better than regular Isaac? Isaac possessed by he who walks behind the rose. It's got something to do with Randall Flagg, doesn't it? Seriously, is there a tornado? Am I watching the movie in 4D? Am I going to have to review the rest of this movie in a shelter along with the characters? The sirens have stopped clearly because I made a human sacrifice. Really, it feels like they could have guessed how to defeat the vengeful god. It's all going to lead to reading scripture and setting the corn on fire like a corn lake of fire. And when it's all over, she's going to murder John Connor herself. Still, this guy would somehow find a way to get tangled in the corn, even if it wasn't possessed like the trees in the Evil Dead. He even gets annoyed by Joby and says, What are you doing here? Get back in the barn! Despite that the kid just saved his ass. Hopefully they can get all this gasohol sprayed on the field before the cloud brain arrives. He can't even throw the bottle right. The kid has to go get it and bring it back so he can give it a better throw. Miraculously, Bert has survived, the most unrealistic thing in the movie. Then the god is off to give Gene Simmons his powers in Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park. Now they have their own little family for their road trip. Ready to commit now, honey? Hint, hint. And they're not even going to address the fact there's still a dead kid in the trunk. Of the 80s King adaptations, Children of the Corn is one that is the very definition of solid rental. Structurally, it's all over the place. Bert isn't exactly the best hero in a King movie, to the point to where it becomes kind of humorous. Even when he wins, he still almost dies and needs to be saved. Seriously, it does feel a little like a rough cut. Here's the end screen. Okay, well, guess we're done here. I'll pick up something at the souvenir shop. 
but despite it needing a couple extra drafts, there is something about it that does still make it very memorable after all these years, and that is the villains Isaac and Malachi, who own every single scene they're in. It's them that makes it totally understandable that the movie gains some popularity. They do make it worth a watch, and the musical score is really good too. But it makes sense it started out as a short. It is the kind of movie that could honestly be edited to about 30 minutes and be a damn good episode of The Twilight Zone. Still though, for a documentary about the Midwest, it is spot on after all these years. Welcome to Nebraska. 